Vielen Dank, dass Sie alle wieder da sind. Und wir beginnen jetzt die Nachmittagssitzung mit dem Thema Beteiligung, Demokratie und Zivilgesellschaft. Dazu haben wir drei sehr prominente Sprecherinnen und Sprecher, die auch zum Teil weit angereist sind. Ich bin sehr dankbar, dass Sie alle den Weg gefunden haben zu uns. Berlin bietet ja derzeit viel Konkurrenz, diese Woche mit der Republika. Und schön, dass Sie auch zu uns gekommen sind. Wir haben bei uns, ich fange mal an mit derjenigen, die am weitesten angereist ist, Francesca Bria aus Barcelona, die ähm, Chief Technology Officer der Stadt Barcelona. Und Francesca hat viele andere wichtige Funktionen inne gehabt und hat auch eine akademische Karriere hinter sich und äh, ist sehr prominent in der Digitalszene, sowohl ähm, durch ihre akademische Arbeit, aber auch ihre praktischen Leistungen auf der Liste der 100 wichtigsten Akteure der Forbes-Liste im äh, Digitalen. Vielen Dank, äh, Frau Professor Bria, dass Sie heute hier sind. Dann aus Brüssel angereist Ursula Pachel, äh, die stellvertretende Generaldirektorin des Europäischen Verbraucherverbandes, Mitglied der High-Level-Group zur Ethik in der künstlichen Intelligenz, also einer äh, Gruppe, die mit 52 Mitgliedern eine ähnliche Aufgabe zu erfüllen hatte, wie wir hier mit 16 und in kürzerer Zeit. Äh, wir können also hier in der Datenethikkommission nur deswegen besser sein, weil wir mehr Zeit haben und natürlich gründlicher arbeiten werden. Und unsere Berichte werden natürlich länger, ausführlicher und äh, klüger sein als das, was äh, da in Brüssel vorgelegt wurde. Ähm, für mich persönlich ist das natürlich ein äh, äh, faszinierender Vergleich, äh, diese parallelen Prozesse beide mitverfolgen zu dürfen. Und ähm, als äh, Dritter und äh, äh, nicht Letzter was die ähm, intellektuellen äh, Beiträge zu unserer Thematik angeht. Matthias Spielkamp, äh, der Gründer und Exekutivdirektor von Algorithmus Watch, ähm, in Deutschland, glaube ich, schon sehr, sehr bekannt durch seine akademischen und publizistischen Beiträge. Man könnte unsere drei Sprecher auch so ähm, beschreiben. Wir haben eine Macherin der lokalen Demokratie in einer Großstadt, der lokalen Beteiligung äh, im Digitalen, das ist Francesca Bria. Wir haben eine Vertreterin der Konsumenteninteressen, die im Lobbyumfeld, im sehr schwierigen Lobbyumfeld der Europäischen Union äh, die Interessen, die breiten Interessen der Konsumenten vertritt. Ähm, und wir haben einen äh, Vermittler zwischen Welten, äh, zwischen den Welten äh, Technologie, Philosophie und Recht, der aus dem Journalismus kommt und vor allem, würde ich sagen, durch Studien, wichtige Studien und eine Sprache, die jeder verstehen kann, das Verstehen von Technologie und den Chancen, aber auch den Risiken der Technologie ermöglicht. Also vielen Dank, dass Sie alle da sind. Wir wollen sprechen über Beteiligung und ich würde vorschlagen, wir beginnen einmal mit Francesca. Wir beginnen nämlich auf der lokalen Ebene äh, mit der Beteiligung in der Stadt, äh, mit der Frage, was sind eigentlich äh, die Voraussetzungen äh, für eine demokratische Gestaltung ähm, und eine Gestaltung nach Grundsätzen politischer Ethik äh, des Digitalen in einer Großstadt. Äh, Professor Francesca Bria, Sie haben das Wort. Thank you very much. It is a real pleasure to be here and uh, from far away. So I'm the Chief Technology and Digital Innovation Officer for Barcelona City Hall, but I'm also a professor in the Institute for Inno in of Innovation for Public Purpose in the UCL in London. And uh, let me first say that um, 
it is actually really interesting what is happening here. I think is uh, one uh, really interesting experiment that you're trying to run. I mean, for the uh, broad diversity of the people that are involved, I mean, maybe it's kind of hard to grasp for us with the translation and everything, but it's very interesting to try and find this common platform and to really put these topics, which are highly important from a political point of view, in a, such an interdisciplinary debate. So thank you very much. I'm learning a lot. Um, so I think that um, the best way to use my time is to really contextualize it in, uh, but in what I'm doing as a chief technology and digital innovation officer and also provide some really concrete examples about what it means for us to reshape a digital city, which is a smart city, I mean a future city, that is not technology-led, that doesn't start from technology, but it starts from people and their fundamental rights. And uh, that's why I think um, the question of data sovereignty and data rights uh, for us are really at the core of the new digital citizenship. And that's why um, cities, uh, I think, are very important because they work in proximity with citizens and also because in this big, broader wave of, of what is uh, usually described as smart city, uh, cities are the ones that run in data-intensive, algorithmic-driven, public transportation, housing, healthcare, and education services. So we are the ones that are closer to the citizen providing these kind of services, and they're all based on a logic of solidarity, on a logic of social cooperation, and collective rights. So it is really about uh, democracy at the end of the day. And in Barcelona, we are working very hard to make sure that the immense economic value that the data represents, that is also value when it comes to city planning, when it comes to delivering public services, when it comes to a, a generally participatory democracy from citizens, doesn't accrue exclusively to technology firms, but can also uh, come back to ordinary citizens and public institutions. So that's what we, why we think it's so important to return some of that value back to the citizens. And that's why, in a sense, in the policies that we run very concretely, we advocate for a new social pact on data that is able to make the most out of data to deliver better these kind of services, while at the same time guaranteeing citizen rights to privacy and information self-determination. So very practically, this means promoting a culture of data sharing. So we want people to have trust because if the trust is lost, obviously, there is also they don't trust the public institutions, they are not going to trust the corporations with their data, and so we lose the ability to really use data to deliver a better society. But at the same time, we want them to feel that their fundamental rights are protected. So yes, yes for a culture of data sharing, but putting people at the center and protect their fundamental rights. And that's why Barcelona has created a digital city plan that really says this is about digital sovereignty. So we call it towards digital sovereignty. So I think uh, a lot of the work really means reconquering the critical digital infrastructures that are long surrendered to the like of Facebook, Alphabet, and Microsoft while protecting citizen rights. Why I say this? Because in a city it's very concrete that when you have a fiber network, I give you the example so it's better. In Barcelona we have a fiber network, which is a public fiber of 700 uh, square kilometers. On top of that, we have an IoT sensor network. It's an Internet of Things platform that's based on open standards, and it's interoperable. And we have sensors where we do waste management for lighting, for parking, for water management, for, um, for, for uh, climate change, so we can measure pollution, we can measure noise, uh, and we can uh, better plan the traffic. So on top of this IoT sensor network, we have a data lake. And this data lake is uh, also built on open source software. And the data lake has a standardized ontology. And this allows us to basically collect data. And we are collecting a lot of more data than a few years ago. But at the same time, 
I'm applying privacy, security, and ethics by design because it's a mix of public data, it's a mix of private data, but also citizen data. And what we have done uh, then in Barcelona in order to be able to uh, take back, let's say, this trust from the citizens through the Decode project, which is one of the flagship projects funded by the European Commission experimenting with distributing ledger technology and cryptography, we have created exactly a blockchain or a distributed ledger infrastructure with the cryptographic, homomorphic encryption and attribute-based cryptography to allow users and citizens to control their identity and their data and be the ones that decide what data they want to keep private. So we advocate for encryption as a human right, what data they want to share, with whom and on what terms. And these terms are this kind of social pact on data because we think that the terms have to be set in an accountable way. I make you another example really clear about how we're using this. We have citizens, citizen community of citizens, that are putting sensors in their home to measure air pollution and to make sure that the quality of the air improve in Barcelona. And they're using Arduino, open hardware, and they're just coming together to interpret you know, how this data affect their life. What we've done is we integrate this data with the IoT sensor network of the city, and through the Decode app, we, we help them to encrypt the data and decide that they want to share this data with whom, maybe they want to share it with their fellow citizens and their community, so that together they can have better ideas on how to solve the problem. They maybe want to share it with the city of Barcelona, but they maybe don't want to share this data with an insurance company or with Uber. So we allow this granular access control to the data using high standard cryptography. By the way, we have developed this project. We work with the city of Amsterdam to implement the technology, but we have a network of best cryptographers in Europe that are helping to us to um, basically implement this model. Let me do another clear example. The Decode uh, infrastructure links to our participatory democracy platform. This is absolutely critical for us because we use large-scale participatory democracy to make better decisions in government. So 400,000 citizens participated into shaping the agenda of the city of Barcelona, and 70% of the actions we run in government today came directly from citizens. And we are using a hybrid process of offline democracy in neighborhood, uh, citizen assembly, talking to all a variety of groups, and then online democracy through the platform. Now, with this technology, we make sure that this data is owned by the citizen of Barcelona, is not owned by a corporation, and is not owned by the government. And also because it's secure, it has privacy, security, and ethics by design, you cannot manipulate the data, and you don't get into the Cambridge Analytica scandal because this data is very powerful for elections or political manifestation. This decision platform is now used by 60 cities around the world, and we have now governments that are starting to use this, and this is a a clear example on how you can scale this type of infrastructure at a European level. So um, basically, uh, what I think is that um, we have also created ethical digital standards in cities, and our policies um, that uh, mandate, for instance, the use of free software, open hardware, interoperability, and open standards in the way we do uh, government procurement processes. Uh, this means that we develop services using this kind of approaches. And also another interesting thing is that we put in procurement uh, processes clauses that we call data sovereignty. What it means is whoever wins the public bid in the city of Barcelona, it may be somebody that uh, deliver a e-bicycle service or waste management or mobility service or the telephone contract, they have to give back the data to the city of Barcelona in machine-readable format. And this data become then a common good, a public infrastructure that we preserve the privacy of the user and the security and the ethics, but then we can open up to the use of cooperative, SMEs, startups, other enterprises that can, together with the city, co-create data-driven services that we need in transportation, in education, in healthcare, and so on. So I think that this is a model that is people-centric, but at the same time protect the personal rights, and uh, we call it a, a new deal on data that's based 
based on a rights-based people-centric framework and doesn't exploit personal data to pay for critical infrastructure. This is absolutely critical because obviously I would say we need to invest in new infrastructure. I think this is something that we talked a bit little about it. I've been also advising the European Commission many years to create programs that fund privacy enhancing technology, distributed rights preserving technologies. And in Europe, we have the best cryptographers in the world. Actually, they are the ones that help the American companies to build better infrastructure. And sometimes we don't capture our talent here, but they have to leave and go to work there instead of helping us to build the alternative infrastructures that we need. But at the same time, I'm also clear that this is also a governance and economic and social issue, and in particular why we don't have incentives to build privacy enhancing rights preserving technology is because of the fundamental flow in the business model of the digital economy that exactly is about the commercial exploitation and manipulation of personal data. I think this we should refuse in Europe and we should build alternative models. So uh, let me just say that in this respect, for me, it's very important that privacy, data sovereignty, and information self-determination, obviously, as we are European, are fundamental rights for all the citizens and not services for the privileged that are going to be able to afford it. I think this is very important because privacy is becoming a service while we think it's a right and it's, a, it's not a privilege for the few, it's a right for the many. And this is also about the digital society that we're building. The digital society that we're building should be a right for all of the citizens and not a privilege for a few that can afford it. And um, just to, uh, to finish uh, my, um, my short introduction, I think that um, what I suggest is some really concrete options about investing more in the infrastructure, using public procurement and specific clauses in the public procurement contract. I think it could be a great way to get back the data sovereignty and then uh, basically develop a European level infrastructure, which is decentralized privacy enhancing and rights preserving, which is tightly regulated on how you can access this data. You should be able to access it in a very transparent way, but the big companies are the one that should pay to access this data, while this data should be available for cooperative, for citizens, for small SMEs, which are created public value with that data. At the moment, it's the other way around. The big companies use our data for free, they don't pay time taxes here, and then we have to pay them again to provide the service. So I think this is very unfair, and we should really come up with, um, with a different way of doing it. Uh, so I really hope that uh, just my last remark is that cities are working in the networks. We are sharing these approaches. Uh, we even promoted a coalition for cities digital rights, uh, New York, Barcelona, and Amsterdam. Now we have 42 cities. It's backed by the UN Habitat. We are putting this kind of data sovereignty approaches at the very center, but we need to elevate it. So we need alliances with uh, progressive governments, with public institutions at all levels, with unions, uh, with citizens' associations, with academics, and so on, to make sure that we can build as Europeans, this um, people-centric, rights-preserving digital framework for our future society. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Francesca Pria. I'm sure we will uh, all come back uh, in the discussion uh, and to discuss uh, your very inspiring thesis. I'm, uh, I, I would say already now, uh, that I would like to discuss uh, a little bit this uh, model of um, um, government procurement and uh, ask a number of questions of you know whether it raises the prices of services to Barcelona and, and what's the cost uh, cost benefit uh, of all this and understanding it a little bit better because uh, by coincidence when I talked uh, to Pro Pro Professor Lambert in the in the break. Oh, sorry. Um, Right, uh, so thank you very much. Um, I would like to come back uh, uh, in the break, uh, uh, in the discussion to uh, the question of, in particular, the government procurement contacts, contracts. Um, uh, for example, the question whether this raises prices for uh, the city of Barcelona because, of course, a contractor who knows that they can't do with the data what they normally do, uh, but must uh, provide the data to, to the city, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there is a pricing issue. 
and so that we understand a little bit how this can work. And I can say that in the break, I had a discussion with Professor Wambach on this uh, question of access to private data. And he actually also said that a middle way of you know, not opening up everything, but at least when governments make contract, when governments pay for services, that governments get then also the use of the data, it could be an interesting middle way. And of course, governments, if you look at it in their totality, you know, we have state quarters in Europe, you know, 40%. They are huge buyers of services. So it would be a big step forward, I think, in terms of creating public value data, which you are doing in Barcelona in this data lake. So thank you very much for this very inspiring presentation. And then I would say we move on to Mrs. Pachel, to the question democracy in Europe, interest uh, representation of citizens, participation, consumer rights uh, versus corporate interests. Uh, this is a constant debate, of course, about Europe. Um, so please, Mrs. Pachel, um, we're looking forward to your presentation. And tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the situation of uh, debate uh, in and around the AI uh, high-level uh, uh, group on ethics, uh, because uh, that's, of course, something where um, you know, we also look to further developments in Europe to see how uh, we can uh, maybe um, not only be uh, having convergence in, in our work, but also add on to the work which already has been done there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nemitz. I will come to that point at the very end of my short presentation, just to not make you disappointed that I don't, don't come to that point. Uh, let me maybe start by saying that, of course, the digital transformation has brought many benefits uh, to consumers, to our societies, and it could definitely bring many more benefits, uh, but it has also raised uh, significant concerns, and I would like to focus on two points here. One is the collection, aggregation, and the use of data, personal data mainly, which is currently, at least if you look at the big dominant players in the market, often done uh, on a, in an unfair and non-compliant um, um, way. And the second point is the use of the new technologies and in particular artificial intelligence and automated decision making um, where humans are subject to that decisions or are affected by them and that often in the perspective of influencing people and even manipulating people. But of course there are also many other aspects to this. So one of the characteristics of these digital markets is um, that they penetrate nearly all aspects of our society. Data-driven business models and practices are important for consumers and citizens in different dimensions of their lives, as economic actors, as data subjects, as political individuals, and as members of the community. And I would like to focus in my intervention on the topic that is at the core of my organization. As I said, we represent national consumer organizations, and that means consumers as participants to the market, as players in the market. And maybe just to make the link to the topic of democracy, we think that obviously um, fair markets and markets that function for consumers, where consumers feel that they can get a fair deal, where they can trust, is also an important element of a democracy and is an important element of trust in our society. So just to frame uh, the points that I'm going to make. So the problem definition, uh, and maybe start maybe first with the positive vision, is that of course we would like to see digitization as the force for the common good and uh, that leads to results uh, that make our societies more inclusive, uh, fair and democratic. Uh, democratic. Uh, and this is uh, not only for consumers but for citizens in general. But despite the possibilities that are created by digital tools and that the general belief and even the mantra is, is still very often that they bring more equality and that they empower people, I have to say that this is obviously far from being the case. Uh, it is very often the contrary. The problem areas that we find particularly pertinent uh, include dark patterns. We have heard about this in online services. Black box syndromes of algorithmic automated decision making. The commer commercialization of everything, including your social relationships, uh, the people that you know, uh, the preferences for cultural and intellectual choices, uh, the digital monopolies and corporate capture that comes with it. Uh, we're moving from a discussion about the risks of loss of privacy to a discussion about 
um, loss of autonomy and self-determination, and of course the risks of permanent surveillance, and I mean first of all commercial surveillance, but of course uh, there is also a lot of risks of state surveillance. Um, in addition, and let me just mention that because it has always been an important element of the internet society, so to speak, this concept of getting something for free, um, or better say, the illusion of getting all these services for free for consumers very attractive, uh, is now not only related to the economic uh, aspects of things, uh, but is also increasingly something about human behavioral aspects, namely that there is an illusion that we are free to do what we want and to decide uh, what we want to do, for example, um, to buy things, uh, when in reality we are often unaware of um, how uh, we uh, decide on what to buy, what offers we see, uh, what prices we pay, uh, and the current situation uh, is moving into um, an environment where there is a lot of influence exercised on people uh, and even manipulation of our behavior. And this has even become an aspirational concept. I would like to refer to the advertising that Netflix uh, has used in the US, which was under the motto, the freedom not to choose. Um, so from a consumer perspective, it's very clear that we have to resist against these developments. I'm a consumer advocate, so I would say we have to fight this. I would uh, very much, I liked very much what Mr. Karakarius uh, said, and, and that was the time of innocence is over. I think we have seen enough to know that there needs to be done something, and I will come back to that because I think it's a very important point. We think ethics are important, but the question is what do they lead to? What are the consequences for people? And do people have rights that they can really use and that they can enforce? There is a lot of discussion about the role of regulation in digital markets that are, should be driven by innovation. But I think we have not come to any better concept than democracy-led regulation. And I will come back to this uh, when we speak about AI and ethics. But before that, I would like to briefly look again at the situation of the consumer. Because I, I, I'm always a bit uh, struck by these comments that consumers have to be better educated and that they should look after themselves and that their parents should look after their children. And this is not something for the state. Uh, I would just like to describe very clearly what is the situation of consumers. And we have some studies that our member organizations did. Uh, one that I would like to refer to is from our UK member, which... The study is called Control, Alt or Delete. You'll find it on the internet. And it clearly shows that there are great levels of concerns about how firms use personal information of individuals. And in addition to that, it is extremely difficult because consumer organizations are also um, multipliers of information. They teach and educate also consumers, or at least they aim to it. And we see that it's extremely difficult to explain to consumers how and where these data collection and data use and processing, how this is uh, done. It's very difficult to observe, understand, let alone control these data flows because much of these business models of the internet, giants in particular, are still in the dark. So the study showed that many people are unsure about their own data being processed by the companies. They feel uncomfortable and they are worried. And it's not that consumers are indifferent about their personal data. It's more that there is a dilemma of hopelessness that leads to resignation. Um, because the profit from this data collection and exploitation, and mainly through selling to the digital advertising industry, is so great, but the inf involvement of consumers is fundamental to this. There is, of course, um, no incentive for these companies to explain how this all functions to consumers, but it's rather the contrary. So uh, the companies rather promote the powerlessness and confusion amongst consumers and try to avoid, of course, that they control their data as they should be able to according to our legislation. And this is where I want to link it to the dark patterns discussion. 
uh, dark patterns in, I would say, European law terms. This means misleading practices, basically. Uh, where we have other studies from our Norwegian member, they show exactly how the big ones, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, continuously share data through the use and collect data through the use of these dark patterns and misleading interface design and not giving consumers a real choice in terms of deciding how they want the data to be used. And just maybe a clarification from the previous discussion, um, if I say choice and consumers don't have choice, I don't mean necessarily between different companies or offers of different companies, but the choice is in relation to the quality of the service. So we don't have so many services that really are compliant with European data protection legislation. This is what I think Mr. Bambang, who is, I think, gone already, uh, what I meant. So what is the regulatory and policy response to these uh, developments? I would like to focus on three elements. Uh, so the first is that we are in a data economy now, uh, but I think we are not at all having an architecture, a concept of a legal framework on to kind of shape this data economy. So this legal framework is very incomplete and at the best fragmented, I would say. So we have the GDPR that is very specific, of course, the pr protection of personal data, but it doesn't go further to look at the data governance uh, in our economy and society. So what we would like to see is a more general legal framework to look at data in their different levels, so supplied data generated in feared personal and non-personal data. That means three points. First of all, personal data protection privacy. We think we need to really carefully assess the GDPR and whether it gives us all the necessary tools that we need to really deal with these new challenges, to mention facial recognition or other biometric technology applications. It's very hard to see how you can give consent if you walk down the street and a sensor scans your uh, eyeballs or scans your face or your physiognomy so that it's uh, something that could be protected by the GDPR. What we also see is that the discussion, um, or better said, that the distinction between personal and non-personal data is increasingly difficult um, and maybe a concept that we have to overcome uh, in the future because it, if you look at IoT, connected products, there is a big discussion already, is that personal data? Many industry players say this is no longer personal data. We owe this data, we control this data, we can do what we want with it. So there is a lot of things to look at. And finally, in relation to automated decision making, and the protection that we currently have in place. Let me just hint to that topic, which is complicated, but very important. We think that the current GDPR um, rules, Article 22, are too narrow, and that basic um, uh, information about automated decision-making and, in certain cases, also the logic, how these are made, these decisions, that should be available in any case, not only in the cases where there is legal consequences or significant consequences. In relation to competition, but I will not go into detail, we think that it's obviously also an important element of consumer welfare. We need competitive, we need fair markets. Uh, and there we think it's time to look at really establishing a data access right. This is very much discussed in Brussels for the time being. We think it's important to make a regulatory move in that direction because otherwise the big companies uh, they sit already on enormous amounts of data. This is an upwards spiral and it will not become possible for competitors or downstream market operators to step in and also um, play their role. And the last point is about artificial intelligence. And the question about what framework do we need in that respect? Obviously, and we have heard many examples already today, consumers are increasingly affected uh, by um, artificial intelligence credit scoring, content filtering on your news feeds or on the search engines, digital assistance in your homes, uh, but also, of course, decisions of public authorities, for example, whether or when you receive certain social allocations about uh, access to educational services, etc. So basically everywhere in our lives we are already or will soon be um, concerned with that. Maybe just to mention that our German member organization, VZBV, who is also here today, they are very much uh, um, um, 
a front runner for consumer organizations in this respect. They have early published uh, surveys and position papers. Uh, just to mention one figure from one of these surveys, which is that 75% of German consumers believe that ADM decisions can be a danger if principles and data used are unclear. So a very clear, I think, uh, call also on policymakers um, to ensure that there is an appropriate framework. Um, not without, uh, I, I don't have time to go in any details, but just to mention three points which we think are particularly important for automated decision making, obviously it must be done in a fair and responsible way. There needs to be a right to transparency and meaningful explanation, but again, the, the burden cannot be on the consumer. Most importantly, we think there needs to be a risk oriented, so depending on what risks are uh, presented by a certain application, a risk oriented technical and organizational system uh, to allow for checks of legal compliance, regulatory oversight and enforcement. So the control of algorithms and the corresponding system that must be established by public authorities are fundamentally important. Uh, before I come to the end, um, I would like to just mention one important point. I don't know if this, um, if you look at all into that, but what strikes me is that when it comes to public funding, so public money that goes into research and promoting uh, the use of AI, uh, there is much um, focus, of course, on industrial policies. If you see what the European uh, Union is doing, for example, and not at all a focus on promoting the use of AI by civil society organizations, for example, consumer organizations, for tools that they can use uh, to make their services for consumers more efficient. I refer to um, scanning tools for contracts or privacy policies, for complaints management, complaints uh, generations, tools for consumers themselves, automated compensation tools. So just to make it very practical, to give you some examples where we think AI could play a very big role. But again, I think there would need to be some public funding also directed in that direction to ensure that there is support for developing these things, and I, I don't see that for the time being nowhere. I come to the end and, and just want to uh, conclude on the level of what is really the way forward for policy makers and for legislators. And there, I think what I wanted to draw your attention to is we have currently a very difficult uh, or let me say a problematic narrative that is arising at least at the European level in Brussels, if you want so, uh, which is that you can um, create trust and you know that the AI high level group that Mr. Nemitz referred to uh, is about trustworthy AI. So this is the concept that has been chosen for the European Union and that this trust can be achieved through industry self-regulation. So if you look at ethics, the guidance that this high-level group has produced, and I'm, a, I'm part of that, and I can say that ethics guidance content-wise is okay, it is not fantastic, but is acceptable as a compromise between many market players and many academic uh, different angles. Um, but now it's really about what do we do with that? And if you look at the recent communication from the Commission, which is from April, there is a lot of allusion about setting up a governance system for self-regulating uh, AI through these ethic guidance. Nobody knows exactly, and not at all even vaguely, how this should look like. Because our experience, and I've been in consumer policy since 20 years, is that it's extremely difficult and has not been possible so far to establish a European self-regulatory governance system that is efficient enough to really deliver something. Uh, and there has been no idea put forward on the table. And I would also be very cautious uh, talking about certification. I think um, Francesca just expressed it very nicely. We don't see protection and fairness in AI or other technology areas as something that should be something consumers have to choose for, that they have to think and carefully reflect and then digest and read the information and then go for something that is certified. That is something we don't want to see as a vision for our society and for consumers. We want to see people 
to be able to rely on their fundamental rights, and this without negotiation. So these topics are non-negotiable. They should not be certified or not. And so what I would like to kind of leave you with is the message that don't get distracted by too much discussions about ethics, because we should really think about what are the topics where ethics play a fundamental role, and what are the topics like transparency, safety, fairness, which are already enshrined in European legislation, in particular in consumer legislation. These are rights that we currently have. So the task that I see is to A, identify whether the current protections that we have in place are still fit for purpose when it comes to these new digital elements and technologies and the practices and the business models that come with it. And secondly, where are the gaps and how can we fill them? There are certainly some gaps, but updating the existing rules, I think, would be already a very big step forward. But ethics are precursors to guide this process. But make it, please, clear as a commission that this cannot replace the legal framework that is democratically legitimized, which, for example, the high-level group is not. I mean, this is a group of experts that has been put together, and now we have uh, this framework. So please do not mingle these two things, it's clear that we need a legal framework that is enforceable and that we can trust fundamental rights are taken serious and are real and that we have a high level of consumer protection for this new economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Pachel, and <coughs> I think you're plea for democracy in action is uh, very welcome here in the Interior Ministry, which is, of course, one of our ministries protecting uh, uh, democracy in Germany. Um, so thank you very much uh, for, for this impetus. And it's uh, uh, the big discussion about uh, democracy in squeeze between populism and technology. I think certainly it is uh, something which um, this commission is very aware of. And um, I think also Brussels is very aware of, and uh, you are also not the first uh, who made a good plea uh, for uh, democracy in action. Uh, uh, we have heard already uh, Konstantinos Karalios before uh, of the IEE, and indeed also the mandate of this uh, uh, commission uh, <clears throat> is very clear. Uh, the government is looking uh, for advice on ethical principles, but also how to make them work, including through law. So uh, rest assured, this is certainly a subject we are discussing uh, intensely um, in, in this commission, and, and we are very well um, aware of, of these um, issues. Thank you very much. And now we move to Matthias Spielkamp. Uh, Herr Spielkamp um, hat uh, ja gerade uh, mit Algorithmus Watch eine uh, sehr wichtige Studie vorgelegt, uh, die uns daran erinnert, <coughs> dass uh, massenhafte uh, Überwas Überwachung nicht nur ein Thema ist, was wir in China oder Amerika sehen, sondern auch in Europa. Ein Papier, das mich persönlich auch sehr interessiert hat, weil es natürlich immer leicht ist, über die anderen sich auf die Schenkel schlagend begeistert zu äußern. Man muss auch immer gucken, was zu Hause passiert. Und es ist schon interessant zu sehen, dass wir in der Datenwelt sehr viel gerichtliche Tätigkeit auch haben, die äh, immerhin da, immer wieder darauf hinausläuft, auch äh, Maßnahmen des Gesetzgebers, ähm, ähm, die, die der Überwachung von Bürgern dienen, aufzuheben. Also insofern sehen wir da auch ganz praktisch die Funktion äh, des Rechtsstaats, äh, die freiheitssichernde Funktion des Rechtsstaats und seiner Institutionen. Das ist ja das Interessante. Wir haben eben nicht nur die Prinzipien auf Papier, sondern wir haben auch Institutionen wie Verfassungsgerichte und auch den Europäischen Menschenrechtsgerichtshof, die dann auch dafür sorgen, dass diese Grundprinzipien durchgesetzt werden. Also Herr Spielkamp, wir hoffen auf einen Beitrag von Ihnen, der uns erhält, wie aus der Sicht der Zivilgesellschaft Demokratie und Partizipation im Zeitalter von künstlicher Intelligenz und äh, Big Data funktionieren können und wie sie verbessert werden können. Vielen Dank für die Einladung. Es ist äh, eine Ehre, hier zu sprechen. I prepared my remarks in English, 
Um, so please bear with me. Um, I would like to tell you a little about, uh, as an organization, what Algorithm Watch is, uh, how we work, how we frame the issue, um, what our goals are, and what results we produce so far, and then end with some recommendations. And I hope this then will all make sense in the context of this uh, hearing here. So um, we consider ourselves, a, um, I mean, it's clear that we are a non-profit organization, but we have the aim to evaluate and shed light on, on algorithmic decision-making processes that have a relevance to society. That's a very important part of that, M meaning that they are either used to predict or prescribe human action or to assist or make decisions automatically. I'll come back to that uh, um, terminology issue a little later. Um, our approach is fourfold. Our mission statement says that we watch, explain, network, and engage. What does that mean? Well, we watch what the developments are and we report about them. We try to explain those developments to the general public, but also to policymakers, uh, civil society, and sometimes even companies. But of course, that also means that uh, we seek a lot of explanation from all of these actors. And uh, last but not least, we engage. And that means that we do take an active part in trying to shape these developments. So we don't only consider ourselves a watchdog organization, but we also take an active part in shaping what is on the table. How do we do that? Uh, first of all, what you usually want to know when you're talking about a civil or to a civil society organization is where does the money come from? These are our different founders that we uh, currently have or had. Um, and I hope we'll find some more in the future so we can continue our work. Um, these are all private foundations, except for the last item there. There was a crowdfunding campaign we did with individual donations, and I'll talk a little, a little more about that later. How do we frame the issue? Now, terminology or discussing terminology is uh, usually pretty much of a showstopper, but I think it's important in this surrounding here, in this context, because we've uh, talked about AI and we heard uh, Constantino say that uh, IEEE doesn't use that um, framing anymore. I'm very happy about that because uh, that's what we also say, automate decision-making should be used instead of AI. Now we can discuss whether algorithmic decision-making or whatnot is a better idea, but uh, these are details. Because algorithmically controlled automate decision-making or decision support systems are procedures in which decisions are initially partly, partially or completely delegated to another person or corporate entity who then in turn use automatically executed decision-making models to perform an action. Now this looks a little convoluted, but what the uh, gist of it is that um, responsibility always lies with humans and not with machines. Um, and we also regard ADM systems always as socio-technical systems. So we are not looking at them as systems of algorithms and data. We are looking uh, at them of systems situated in society and in uh, a debate that is either actively um, pursued or not, and then we seek to um, change that. By saying systems instead of technologies, we point to the fact that we need to take this holistic approach because an ADM system, in our use of the term, is this framework that encompasses a decision-making model, an algorithm that translates this model into computable code, the data this code uses as an input, either to learn from it or to analyze it by applying the model, and the entire political and economic environment surrounding its use. Because sometimes the important decision that is made is we have austerity, we don't have money to do something that we uh, would like to be doing, so we use automation to alleviate that problem. And uh, that, in most cases, is a bad approach to take. And then we ask uh, people, developers and uh, people, computer scientists who deal with uh, um, fairness of um, machine learning approaches to then solve something that has been messed up in the first place in a different place. Now, what is our goal? Our goal is that ADM systems benefit individuals and society. Now, this is everyone's goal, it appears, right? Whenever you read an AI strategy, be it the German one or someone else's, or you hear companies talk about that, uh, it seems that always it, the goal is that these systems benefit individuals and society. And there's nothing wrong with that, but of course, we have our doubts that it really is the goal of uh, many of these stakeholders. So um, it's, we see it as our duty to find out whether um, the, um, the different stakeholders uh, um, put the money where their mouth is. 
Our position is that we are an evidence-based advocacy organization. I'll give you a couple of examples of what we do in research in a minute. And we are neither adversarial to government and the public sector nor to private companies. So we are not saying that automation or using automated decision-making systems is a bad idea. And we've heard a couple of good examples of where they can provide value to societies and individuals already today. Um, so we participate in multi-stakeholder deliberation processes to develop solutions as the one that I consider such a process here. Um, but we also run campaigns when needed, meaning that um, if we are not satisfied with the course of uh, action that is being taken, then we try to make people aware of that and also uh, put some pressure on the different actors here. Now, I brought two case studies. One uh, Paul already mentioned. It's the one. It's the report that we published in at the end of uh, January in Brussels at the European Parliament. Automating Society, Taking Stock of Automated Decision-Making in the European Union, which was a collaboration of Algorithm Watch with the Bertelsmann Stiftung. And the idea of that was um, that examples that we usually use to discuss are mainly from the United States or China. Risk assessment of criminals, death by algorithm in the health sector, uh, social scoring, and such. Um, but the fact is that in the European Union, although the situation is very different for legal and cultural reasons, this does not mean that these ADM systems do not exist. It's quite the contrary. Now, the European Union is pretty diverse. That's why we weren't able to look at all different countries in the European Union. But what we um, succeeded in was to look into the situation in 12 different countries. So we compiled a network of 15 different researchers from 12 countries to uh, look at these. Now, the researchers were academics, journalists, civil society members from all these different uh, places. And they, uh, they came from the fields of media studies, journalism, law, cultural studies, international relations, sociology, philosophy, data journalism, and political studies. So quite an interdisciplinary network from a, ver a variety of backgrounds. The results? Um, automated decision making is widely used for different purposes in the European Union already. We have systems that try to identify children vulnerable to neglect in Denmark. We have systems allocating treatments for patients in the public health system in Italy, detecting welfare fraud in the Netherlands, uh, allocating benefits to the unemployed in Poland, detecting learning problems in primary and secondary schools to help teachers find problematic pupils in Slovenia assigning social benefits in Sweden, and of course, many cases of predictive policing systems that are used in a variety of EU member states. Now, we consider all of these, in a sense, automated decision-making systems, and this is why they were in our focus. Now, this does not mean that we are not talking about the private sector as well, or at the same time, but I'll come back to that in a minute in the other case study. Now, what are our results? First of all, awareness is lacking. Many people are not aware that this is the case. And I mean, it's, it's good that that is one of the results, because otherwise we wouldn't have needed to do the report itself, but of course, this needs to change. Uh, oversight is inadequate. We have a couple of examples where you can argue that, oh, wow, uh, there's a system being implemented and no one really knows about that, no one discusses that, and there's basically no entity that is assigned to look into um, whether this system is appropriate, whether it's doing what it's supposed to uh, do, and uh, what the results are. Now, the second um, case study I would like to highlight today is Open Schufa. Now, for the people from Germany, it's pretty clear what this is about. From people from other countries, Schufa is the, uh, at least in the B2C market, in, in the, yes, in the B2C market, the dominant um, credit scoring company that is active in Germany. Um, now, what we did is quite a complex research that looks like this, you know, from the initial idea in uh, the summer of 2017, we started to partner with other um, um, entities, especially the Open Knowledge Foundation Germany and Spiegel Online as a media partner. We developed a campaign and hooked up with a platform that enables people to ask online for the uh, scores that Schufa is required by law to hand out to them. We started a crowdfunding campaign with a very successful video that I would have liked to show you, but for lack of time, I have to um, guide you to YouTube and look it up there. Um, and then we had some reporting on that. We had a very interesting statement by Schufa itself that I put in here as a screenshot, and you can get an idea of uh, 
um, how long it was and how much work they put in there to accuse us of being uh, enemies of the state by uh, trying to undermine uh, Germany as the place to do business. And then in March uh, to May 23rd, uh, 2018, we developed a data donation platform where then people were able to donate their Schufa scores to that we then used to analyze um, what Schufa is actually doing and whether there are systematic problems in the system. Now, uh, one of the problems at the outset here is that Schufa is, uh, at, at that time, was um, only sending out their scores on paper. Um, which meant that um, it was pretty problem problematic to pass the data and to come up with uh, valuable uh, data sets. Uh, nevertheless, there was a journalistic reporting in November of 2018, last year, um, by Spiegel Online and the Bayerischer Rundfunk Public Broadcasting Station, and they pointed to a couple of problems that I will not go into detail here right now, which then led to the German Minister for uh, Justice and Consumer Protection to say that there should be more transparency transparency um, in Schufa and other credit scoring systems. That was, of course, a great success for our campaign. The problem is the consequences were none. Nothing has changed so far. On the contrary, we get less data from Schufa than we got before the um, uh, general data protection uh, regulation came into effect. Um, the Data Protection Authority of Hesse, who is the oversight institution that is in charge of uh, Schufa, has so far done, I wouldn't say nothing, but it's close to nothing to change that. And the situation right now is that uh, Schufa thinks that it's appropriate to uh, comply with the um, general data protection regulation, asking to send out machine-readable formats by sending out letters that give people a code that they can then use to download JPEGs of their scores, okay? So this is the situation of transparency at, uh, when it comes to automate decision-making processes that basically affect everyone in this country. Now, of course, we are thinking about strategic litigation, but uh, that's a long way to go, and uh, we'll figure out whether that makes sense. What are our recommendations then, in general, from uh, different research uh, projects that we did? First of all, focus the discussion on the politically relevant aspects. I didn't dwell on this here, but you know, I don't think we should think about um, super intelligence and the singularity too much, but we have more pressing things on our tables. Consider automated decision-making systems as a whole, not just the technology. Empower citizens and public administration to adapt to new challenges. We think this empowerment is an important aspect in this whole debate because we do live in a democratic country. It's a free society, so of course we have responsibility to also know ourselves what is going on. It has limits, as uh, Ursula already pointed out. I'm very glad about that. Make sure adequate oversight bodies exist and are up to the task. Involve a wide range of stakeholders in the development of criteria for good design processes and audits, including, of course, civil liberty organizations. And I'm specifically saying civil liberty organizations and not just civil society organizations, because there's a difference in focus here. And last but not least, and that's a very specific one, mandate the public sector to provide transparency about the use of ADM systems, where, how, what for, bought from whom. That's why I was so curious about hearing what our Danish colleague had to say this morning. And I'd like to make you aware of another study that is brand new that just came out yesterday. It's the British uh, Bureau of Investigative Journalism that did a study of um, systems, ADM systems being used in the UK public sector. And uh, the key takeaways that they came up with is it is basically impossible to find out what is going on. Okay, so I think we need to change that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested in that discussion, we have a mailing list that we call the Algorithmic Accountability Reporting Mailing List. And you may want to sign up to that. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Herr Spielkamp. Gerade Ihr Beispiel, dass diejenigen, die künstliche Intelligenz benutzen, sich dann der Überprüfung entziehen, indem sie Papierinformationen geben, das ist schon interessant. Das gibt mir schon einige Ideen, was man da vielleicht machen könnte. Ähm, und ähm, Ihr Hinweis auf die Intransparenz im öffentlichen Sektor, ähm, das ist ja ein Thema, was auch in Amerika schon äh, durch AI Now ähm, identifiziert wurde. Also die Transparenzpflicht des öffentlichen Sektors fängt mal damit an, dass man weiß, 
wo eigentlich der öffentliche Sektor äh, solche automatisierten Systeme benutzt. Also vielen Dank für die Einsichten äh, an alle drei Referenten. Ich möchte ähm, Sie jetzt in der Diskussionsrunde bitten, auch etwas ähm, an die ganz normalen Demokratieprozesse zu denken. Also auch einmal die Frage äh, noch einmal an die Referenten und auch in die Runde, wenn wir jetzt diskutieren, ähm, gibt es eigentlich ein Potenzial äh, in der künstlichen Intelligenz und in der Datenwelt, das Engagement der Menschen in der Demokratie, also angefangen von der Teilnahme an Wahlen äh, über die, das Engagement in äh, Parteien, oder Verbänden oder Zivilgesellschaft zu erhöhen. Also ganz einfache Grundfragen der Demokratie vielleicht auch noch mal zu adressieren. Das ist vielleicht etwas, was auch bisher in der Diskussion zu kurz gekommen ist. Also das positive Potenzial vielleicht, Frau Professor Brier, können Sie was dazu sagen, hat in Barcelona die Bürgerschaft sich, sagen wir mal, der Stadtpolitik zugewandet? Sieht man da mehr Engagement? Ist die Wahlbeteiligung, Sie haben ja bald Wahlen, ist das voraussehbar, dass die größer wird, weil Sie digitale Tools haben oder nutzen die Bürger die digitalen Tools auch für die Beteiligung an demokratischen Prozessen? Also ich glaube, wir müssen auch so ein bisschen über die politische Ethik dieser Technologie nachdenken. Das würde mich einfach auch noch mal interessieren. Und was mich auch interessieren würde, Frau Professor Bria, noch mal zurückkommt auf die Frage der Kosten für Barcelona, dieses Modells, dass Sie alle Ihre Vertragspartner aus der Privatwirtschaft verpflichten, die Daten Ihnen zur Verfügung zu stellen. Führt das dazu, dass die Angebote, die Sie bekommen, teurer werden oder dass vielleicht die interessanten Firmen, die das besonders gut können, dann nicht äh, die Dienste bei Ihnen anbieten? Oder wie ist Ihre Erfahrung sozusagen der Ökonomie dieser äh, zusätzlichen Belastung äh, der Vertragspartner äh, mit, mit dieser Pflicht? Damit würde ich gerne die Diskussion eröffnen. Ähm, und in der ersten Runde können Sie ja vielleicht auf diese Fragen noch mal eingehen. Wer möchte ähm, Fragen stellen? Und wenn wir keine Fragen haben, lassen wir auch Kommentare zu. Bitte, hier hinten links geht's los. Sagen Sie noch mal bitte Ihren Namen und äh, die... Oliver Rack, Government-Netzwerk und Politics for Tomorrow. Eigentlich eine ganz äh, profane Frage, weil Sie es jetzt gerade aufgebracht haben. Mich würde interessieren, inwiefern man künstliche Intelligenz darauf, dafür einsetzen kann, eben Szenarien zu simulieren, in spielhafter Weise und damit auch praktisch das Verhalten der, äh, der, 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 der Gesellschaft in bestimmten perspektivischen Fragestellungen schon mal in Simulationen äh, zu erörtern und zu finden, inwiefern uns da künstliche Intelligenz weiterhelfen kann und vielleicht künstliche Intelligenz ein Anlass für eine, äh, für eine solche Spielsimulation schon sein könnte, weil ich glaube, da ist ein großes äh, öffentliches Interesse dran. Danke. Vorhin haben ja 20 äh, äh, Kollegen die Hände gehoben äh, beim technischen Wissen über die Kapazitäten der Künstliche Intelligenz, gibt es da jemand, der was dazu sagen kann? <lacht> Tja, da müssen wir uns noch mal ausstatten äh, mit weiterer Expertise. Aber trotzdem vielen Dank äh, für die Frage. Gibt es weitere Fragen? Ja, bitte. Ja, Andrea Timsfeld von der Generali Deutschland. Ich habe eine Frage an Herrn Spielkamp. Sie hatten gesagt, also ähm, was die Konsequenzen der Schufa anbelangt, es passierte nichts. Ähm, mich würde interessieren, was Sie denn ähm, erwartet haben, was passiert, beziehungsweise wie eine Reaktion ausgesehen hätte der Schufa, die ähm, ja, ihre Erwartungen erfüllt hätte oder die sozusagen für Sie in Ordnung gewesen wäre. Also vielleicht zuerst mal, die Schufa hat äh, insofern für uns natürlich sehr positiv reagiert, dass sie geradezu versucht hat, den Streisand-Effekt herbeizuführen. Das ist ihr nicht ganz gelungen, weil ihre Stellungnahme fast niemand gelesen hat. Aber von der Schufa erwarten wir uns natürlich relativ wenig. Die, deswegen habe ich ja auch die Folie mit der Aussage von Frau Barley an, ans Ende gestellt und nicht die Aussage der Schufa. Das heißt, wir gehen nicht davon aus, dass ein Unternehmen, also man kann erwarten, da sind wir wieder beim Thema Ethik, man kann erwarten, dass 
Unternehmen ähm, über das gesetzlich geforderte Maß hinausgehen, aber das sollte man nicht erwarten. Ähm, was man aber erwarten sollte, ist, dass die Regulierung angemessen auf das reagiert, was an technischen Möglichkeiten zur Verfügung steht. Und die Forderungen, die wir an tatsächlich die Schufa selber, aber auch natürlich ans Bundesjustizministerium und an die Aufsichtsbehörden stellen, jetzt, das haben wir auch auf der Open Schufa Website veröffentlicht, das ist eben, dass mehr darüber klar gemacht wird, wie das System funktioniert. Die Schufa muss der Aufsichtsbehörde gegenüber darlegen, dass sie nach den aktuellen technischen Möglichkeiten und nach dem Stand der Wissenschaft arbeitet. Das tut sie aber auf die Art und Weise, dass sie eben Gutachten in Auftrag gibt, die außer der Schufa und der Aufsichtsbehörde niemand zu sehen bekommt. Daher wünschen wir uns an der Stelle erheblich mehr Transparenz. Und es wird nicht dadurch geschehen, dass die Schufa das freiwillig macht. Jedenfalls gehen wir davon aus, sondern sie muss dazu gezwungen werden. Genauso muss sie dazu gezwungen werden, dass sie eben mehr Transparenz in ihrer Auskunft gewährt. Die Daten, die sie herausgibt, sind seit, der, seit Inkrafttreten der DSGVO weniger geworden. Und äh, das kann schlecht sein. Und außerdem gehen wir davon aus, und wir hatten das Thema ähm, DSGVO und automatisierte Entscheidungen ja heute auch schon angesprochen hier und wie, ähm, ob, das ob der Artikel 22 ausgeweitet werden muss. Wir haben die Situation, dass die Schufa sagt, wir erstellen einen Score, wir entscheiden nicht selber. Diejenigen, die den Score verwenden, um zu entscheiden, sagen, wir entscheiden zwar, aber erstens nicht automatisch und zweitens machen wir den Score nicht. Und äh, da sagen wir, ähm, das sieht uns sehr nach einer Regulierungslücke aus und der müsste man sich mal zuwenden. Ja, meine Frage äh, knüpft an die beiden ersten Vorträge an. Sie haben, wenn ich das richtig verstanden habe, beide ein Plädoyer dafür gehalten, sozusagen die sowas wie Fairness, Transparenz, Sicherheit nicht nachzulagern, dass äh, sozusagen das Handeln erstmal äh, voranschreitet und man dann so eine, Art, äh, so eine Art Filter einbaut, sondern dass das eigentlich der Ausgangspunkt sein muss, das Recht auf Transparenz, Fairness und so weiter. Und meine Frage wäre jetzt, äh, Vielleicht auch an äh, anwesende Techniker ist sozusagen, wenn man so eine Haltung einnimmt, das ist eigentlich nicht vor, diese Prinzipien sind nicht verhandelbar. Ähm, müssen wir dann ähm, bestimmte Anwendungen ähm, maschinellen Lernens, äh, können wir die dann eigentlich gar nicht äh, zum Einsatz bringen, weil sie eben mit, einer bestimm mit einem bestimmten Maß an Intransparenz verbunden sind und müssen wir dann sozusagen entweder die Kröte schlucken oder sagen, äh, wir sind unter Umständen bereit, auf ein Maß an Transparenz zu verzichten, wenn wir dann äh, den Nutzen, den uns diese äh, Verfahren nachweislich bringen, äh, dann auch äh, sozusagen äh, einbringen, äh, dann zum Einsatz bringen wollen. Shall I also get your questions? Yeah, okay, great. So let me start with the questions around democratic um, use of um, digital tools for democratic participation. So, I mean, I really think um, that's an urgent debate because I don't think there is any way back. I mean, obviously, citizens are participating using online digital tools and they participate in every kind of political process. And actually, before I got this role in Barcelona, I was working in Nesta in the UK Innovation Foundation, and I was leading the biggest project uh, from the European Commission on new forms of participation and digital democracy. So I've been studying what political parties are doing, uh, what civil society organizations were doing, what's happening in uh, parliaments, and so on. And obviously, nowadays, more and more, this is becoming the norm. I mean, people in political parties are adopting digital tools for for um, their party members to vote for manifestos, even to vote for members before election times. Uh, they're voting many issues online. And I mean, there are, there are countries that already use um, e-petition um, systems and even digital uh, voting when it comes to specific issues. So I think, I mean, for us, it's obvious that the citizens are more and more interacting digitally. And the real problem is that we shouldn't let this happen in platforms that are obviously 
actually not designed for political participation with the democratic guarantees we need. So if all the political participations happen on Facebook, then what you get is Cambridge Analytica. So for us in city level also, where many cities are now running you know, petition system, participatory budgeting, involving citizens into proposing ideas that become policies, it was absolutely critical to build a digital infrastructure for political participation with the democratic guarantees. And a lot of those guarantees pass through, OK, who can access the data? Who cannot manipulate the data? Who, um, I mean, we use free software, and our data is auditable. Our software is auditable, and the data as well, by community of experts and security experts. And so we can guarantee we have a e-secure uh, petition system. We can guarantee, really, that we are not we cannot manipulate the data, and even us that run the system don't know, only know the attributes that we need to know to run the service. So I think this is um, increasing participation, public participation, if you do it in the right way, and when this is not happening in the right way, and I have a lot of examples, this is of course leading to this kind of mi mistrust and breakdown of society until the, the, the kind of populists rise up that use a lot of this kind of tools to manipulate voters before elections. Um, let me go to the second question of the cost of service. So um, I want to start from uh, one of the big problems, I think, in the public sector. So a lot has changed in the way we deliver public services in public institutions, and more and more with digitalization. We are moving to a model where digital serv I mean, services are going to be digital by default, and citizens are going to interact more and more through digital services. What happens is that what is valuable about the service you deliver is in the intangible parts, intellectual property, data, the software and the knowledge. And what has happened many, many years in the public sector is that these intangible assets and the know-how of the public administration is externalized, is outside. And what this means is that our public officials are losing the capabilities, which are the critical capabilities, to be able to manage properly public institutions, to innovate and to serve the citizens. So this is really a matter of by basically taking back the know-how and the data, and by training public officials when they do public procurement contracts. I found out in my organization, I mean, here we are in a ministry, that in the procurement office there were very little people that were even caring about this stuff. They were drafting contracts and they weren't looking at IP laws, um, data, the software ownership, like they weren't really looking at that. So we had to like give, um, bring in uh, experts that knew about intangible value and then we had to code this kind of new uh, rules to make sure that the uh, that they know how stays in the public institution and, and belongs to the citizens. So I would say there are some campaigns that say public money, public code. We have maybe to start say public money, public data, and then of course accountability on the kind of uh, automated decision processes. I just want to mention on this um, regarding the fairness, transparency, and machine learning, uh, we are starting um, using some of those services. And the departments that were starting uh, doing the implementation with machine learning, they haven't even thought about the uh, fair processes and they had that the, the fact that they had to run some uh, um, privacy impact assessment and algorithmic decision uh, impact assessment before rolling out the service. So now, basically, I'm working with those teams that before the service gets public, and we are like putting, introducing a methodology that makes sure that we are learning from that. We are going to turn it into a law, like we've done with our data directive. And now we are collaborating with other cities, New York uh, City, uh, Helsinki, and Amsterdam, in creating um, automated decision-making laws for the public sector. And um, I mean, I cannot answer to the fact, would you ban? I mean, I think that we have a lot of responsibility in the public sector to make sure that we can show that there is a process behind and you are not leading to some discrimination in basic social services that citizens may be discriminated for their race because they are poor or because they come from an unprivileged background and or because they are women even sometimes. So this is really a problem in the public sector. Um, I think that was 
all. I don't know if you want uh, the question of price, because you insisted a lot about the question of price. I actually didn't answer it. So um, the, the value of the service, of, of the procurement, it's the same. So when you procure a specific service for what you need, I mean, you have a procurement process and you set, a, I mean, then you, you bid, I mean, there is a bid. And I think that the question of price in public sector shouldn't be the only thing, in particular in technology. Most of the time we are reduced to choose the service because of the lower price, which is always bad. Because also, if you look at, for instance, I mean, for, a, for all, lots of reasons, but in particular, if you want, for instance, to make sure that um, SMEs and small companies can work with the city administration, and they have to, you know, we have to invest with public money uh, so that they can also provide the service. The big companies can provide the service much cheaper because that's not how they make the money. They make the money maybe with licensing, with our data and other things. So the price of the service, that shouldn't be like the only you know, standard in private procurement, absolutely. And then maintaining that service when you have the know-how and you train the people. I mean, we hired uh, 55 new people in the IT company of Barcelona in order to manage dig digitalization. I don't know what's happening here in the ministries, but I know you have to invest in human resources, capacity building in your people in order to be able to innovate. And otherwise, you know, you will be basically not able anymore to provide those services to the citizens and the citizens will stop paying taxes because they know that the city is not able anymore to provide the services. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Bria. My question was, maybe you can say a word about it. Has, in the end, in terms of public service quality, Barcelona been served? Do the citizens now have better services than before? Do they participate more in city democracy than before? You have described a lot what you do but the effective results, can you say a word about that? Thanks also to these processes by which we uh, actually uh, create a lot of data in a transparent way. So Barcelona publishes all the public procurement uh, processes that we do so that we are like very transparent about how we spend the public money. We publish all the salaries, all the money, how we invest it. We monitor continuously. The, we do like a really kind of data-driven uh, policy making. I mean, I even created an office of 40 people that work in a data office that uses data in order to create better decisions and publishing the data and show the results of the programs that we do to the citizens. And this allow us to show what works, what doesn't, how the service is doing. You can track progress. So it's much more also, I mean, what we do and the success of the delivery of the services is much more measurable from the citizen themselves. So I believe this is also a methodology to measure the quality of the delivery of the services. And I have to say, yes, it is improving because for First of all, there is less corruption, there is more transparency, there is better delivery, because otherwise, you know, you spend a lot of time and resources in processes that are not efficient. And, um, and I believe this is on Barcelona being well served. Okay. Yes, thank you. I wanted to respond to your question uh, about transparency and fairness and these principles, values or rights, whatever you, you call them. Um, I mean, this was a very general question, so the very general answer for me would be uh, exactly what I think has already come up, the principle that technology should serve people and should serve their rights, so to speak, and not the other way around. So we should not adapt because technology cannot deliver to our principles. So that's just to say that that's maybe a starting point. But if you look at transparency, for example, what we would ask for, it's first of all information of whether at all there is an ADM system involved in the decision making. Secondly, explanation, like it is now in the GDPR already for certain ADM processes, about the logic and the consequences of the decisions. Um, in fairness, we are talking about principles that we have already enshrined in the legislation, though the question is really, how do you apply them and how are they interpreted in order to uh, come to the result that a certain practice is compliant? And we have other areas of legislation where we have these principle-based approaches and then you need case law or you need third-level legislation or standardization to fill that in. So uh, I think this is all possible. Of course, it's important also to say to mitigate these potential conflicts, uh, we argue uh, for a risk based approach 
to regulation in terms of systems should be regulated or the deepness of the regulation should depend on the risk level that they pose to people or to society. So that's one thing. And the other thing to potentially address these terms uh, or the, these problems could be uh, to have an impact assessment that is done beforehand where you see where there is a conflict of principles maybe of transparency, accuracy and efficiency of the system and where you can already anticipate certain problematic uh, conflicts that are then looked at by an authority, for example, when we talk about healthcare applications or automated driving that really have a high risk potential. So that's just to give you some answers to that question. Vielen Dank, Frau Prachel. Wir haben noch eine Frage. Es ist jetzt 15.30 Uhr, aber eine Frage machen wir noch. Bitte kurz. Hello, my name is Stefan Herwig. I run a small internet governance think tank. We're trying to look at internet governance and internet politics issues uh, from a scientific way. I would love to underline some of the things that Mrs. Poschel said um, about the um, uh, interlinks between functioning markets and harms to democracy. Um, because I think that that point hasn't been stressed enough that maybe looked at closely enough. Unfortunately, it might be a little longer, but I'll try to wrap it up. Um, um, uh, first of all, uh, we looked at market failure, uh, the relationship to consumer powers and also to the platform economy, because I think that there's a, a, a huge connection between data extraction and the development of the platform economy. Um, we ha have constituted in our findings that we have a multiple market failure that also results in the market choices narrowing down on terms of competition, and that means that they narrow down in terms of consumer choice, right? So that is, uh, consumer choice is going, going down. And uh, there's also um, a narrowing, or the bright, uh, a larger gap between, um, uh, because it used to be like a data versus service kind of deal, between um, the service that is being provided and the data that is being extracted. I would like to point out one of the issues that is AI-related, uh, the technology of uh, voice-activated assistance. I'm not sure if you have discussed that before, but that's the most invasive technology that we have so far. And they are being smuggled into our households every day. And I still have yet to see one press article nailing the point about speech assistance. So what I'm trying to say is like, The service you get and the data you pay for, there's no market relationship between that, right? Thank you very much. Uh, I think it would be good if you have a detailed study on this, uh, you send it to us uh, like the IEE, uh, Mr. Carajillos has offered to send his materials and we will uh, take this to the file and look at it in our further deliberations. So it's uh, 3.30 now and... Uh, okay. Is it possible? I just want to say something really quickly because you mentioned the platform economy. I just want to say that beyond the procurement uh, process, there is also an interesting way, like, some, like many cities are coming together, there is a sharing city alliance. When we negotiate with the big platforms like Uber, Airbnb, which are landing on the cities, one of the things that you can do and that we're starting to negotiate is the fair access to data. And this is absolutely because we cannot regulate if we don't know how they're using the data, what is happening, how this is having a negative effect or negative externalities and so on. So this is another way where we can get back, you know, some of this access in fair terms of the data during the regulation of the sharing platforms when they're landing in the cities. So many cities are doing that now. Vielen Dank. Frau Wuppen, unsere Vorsitzende, hat mir gerade signalisiert, wir haben noch drei Minuten. Ich sehe hier noch eine Frage. Herr Martini, Mitglied der Datenethikkommission, hat aber zurückgezogen. Eine Frage noch die Dame und eine Frage noch der Herr. Und der Herr. Okay. okay. Ich habe eine. Mikro. Mikro, bitte. Knöpfchen. So, ich habe eine schnelle Bemerkung, ähm, weil die Frage gestellt wurde, ob wir zum Beispiel in bestimmten Bereichen Blackbox-Systeme verbieten müssen. Und ich glaube, ich habe darauf keine Antwort. Das ist eine wichtige Frage, die wir uns stellen müssen. Aber es gibt noch einen Zwischenschritt. Ähm, im, das Landeskriminalamt Nordrhein-Westfalen, was das erste ähm, Bundesland war in Deutschland, was ortsbezogenes Predictive Policing genutzt hat, die haben in ihrer Testphase 
zwei Systeme parallel laufen lassen, ein neuronales Netz und einen Entscheidungsbaum. Und dann haben sie sich danach angeschaut, ob diese beiden Systeme einen Unterschied in Accuracy haben und sich dann für das System entschieden, nachdem sie festgestellt haben, die Accuracy ist ungefähr gleich, was leichter verständlich ist, also in dem Fall für den Entscheidungsbaum. Und ich glaube, dass man von öffentlichen Institutionen zumindest verlangen kann, dass sie solche Simplicity-Tests durchführen und das wäre eine sehr praktische Forderung. Ähm, meine Frage wäre, es wurde jetzt häufiger bei Oversight gesprochen und dass wir bestehende oversight Body stärken müssen. Ähm, glauben die drei RednerInnen, die gerade gesprochen haben, dass wir auch zusätzlich neue Oversight-Organisationen schaffen müssen? Vielen Dank für den wichtigen Kommentar und auch die Ja-Nein-Frage, die dann die drei kurz mit Ja oder Nein beantworten können. Äh, und hier haben wir noch eine Frage. Schnell bitte. Damit es noch schneller geht, nur eine Bemerkung, zwar die Frage Selbstregulierung oder Gesetz. Bei uns in der Praxis des Europäischen Verbraucherzentrums bereiten nie die Anbieter ein Problem, die irgendwie bereit sind, einer Selbstregulierung zu unterwerfen, sondern es sind immer die, die ohne Spielregeln arbeiten. Und deshalb ist eine gesetzliche Regulierung aus unserer Sicht wichtig. Vielen Dank. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask, in, in the U.S., we've seen a lot of um, bots being started to empower citizens. So, you know, to, um, you know, a bot that helps you apply for asylum and get a visa or overturn your speeding ticket or drug conviction. Um, it seems like that's kind of the opposite of some of these ADMs in government. I wanted to ask if we've seen much of that in Europe or if um, specifically if, if cities are thinking about implementing systems so they can do that. Thank you, Daniel. I can tell you, yes, flight right and uh, Hartz IV Bescheide in Germany, you can have automatic review and uh, the, the law firm which offers the automatic review of the social aid decisions, Hartz IV Bescheide, they are supposedly now the biggest social law firm in Germany. Uh, so anyway, the last round for the um, speakers uh, to answer the question and maybe a word of uh, uh, if you still have urgent things to say and then we close the session. Please, Mrs. Pachel, you start and then we go to the left. Sorry, I can be very brief, uh, maybe just referring to the question about oversight, so the answer would be yes. So we need, I think, to equip uh, the authorities in the respective sectors with the knowledge and the capacity to deal with these specific systems, so that's one thing. One idea would be that they have specific experts for that, but maybe also let me say that we see an increased need of cooperation and interdisciplinary uh, kind of um, perspectives on the data economy and practices that are used there in order to ensure efficient enforcement. Thank you. Danke, Frau Pachel. Also keine neuen Institutionen. Klare Antwort. I know you said no. <laughs> I mean, the question is, does this mean an additional specific single standing uh, oversight body? There, I would say I don't have an opinion. The question is, what is the result of it and can we ensure decent enforcement? If that is centralized or not, I don't have a clear opinion on that. Thank you. Now, that would be, um, yeah, a difficult question in a sense, centralized at what level? You mean at a European level or at a national government level or at the city level? I mean, I, I, I think that um, in, my, in my experience, we need a better enforcement of all those principles and all those rules. And this, of course, can come when you do good laws. It's, of course, uh, better. But then uh, you need to train public administration in enforcing them. And I think in the technology world, we need to make um, technology. I mean, we need to embed those rules in the technology, in the design process. I mean, obviously, security ethics by design. I'm training my officials in cryptography. I mean, this is like I created an office that does that. and. You know, we're doing a lot of courses in privacy enhancing technologies and cryptography. So yes, this is like needed, but I don't I'm not sure it answer your question. But no, did not quite. But that happens. We cannot ask too much. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, my impression is yes, we do need additional oversight. Um, and one uh, sector that comes to mind is uh, labor human resources management and labor relations. Um, and there may be more, but uh, I'm not so sure about that. But I would also follow um, Ursula Pachel's lead that the ones that are already existing need strengthening. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting hearing, the good discussion, and your 
coming here and uh, giving us your information. And now we have a coffee. Until four. Until four.